Welcome, everybody. Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, whatever you are in the world. Welcome to Icon X Talks, Connecting the World and the Universe. My name is Professor Martin Thuo. I'm now coming to you from North Carolina State University, uh, having shifted from Iowa State University just recently. And this month, we are very uh, privileged to be uh, talking about uh, bioengineering, and we are very fortunate to have uh, Professor Peter Wang from University of California kick off this month's theme. We will have uh, Professor Johan Foster from University of British Columbia, followed by Professor Wang, and then uh, uh, Pro uh, Dr. Kelly Chibari from University of Cape Town, Professor Chibari will anchor uh, the, the month at the end. Uh, today, I will have uh, uh, be assisted by four panelists. Uh, that's uh, uh, Anthony Chen and uh, uh, Xun Yang Xiong and Yinjing Qi, um, all from Peking uh, and uh, Shanghai Jiantong University. And uh, to introduce our speaker today, uh, anybody in the bioengineering space, I think Peter doesn't need a lot of introduction. Uh, he's very well established in the area of cell programming and uh, molecular imaging. And to give you a background, a little background about our speaker today, uh, Professor Wang uh, is a graduate of Peking uh, University, where he got his uh, bachelor's degree and his master's degree before um, moving to University of San, uh, UC San Diego, where he got his PhD. And then after that, he also did a postdoc at UC San Diego. Then he, he started his career at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, that is in the Midwest, where he uh, was affiliated uh, with, uh, uh, where he, he started his work on uh, biomedical um, engineering. And then uh, later he went back to UC San Diego, uh, where uh, he has built uh, his work and has continued to do amazing uh, research. He's a Professor uh, Wang is a fellow of uh, American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. Uh, he is an, an NSF uh, career awardee. He is also a, a recipient of the Wallace Head Coldly Ari Career Award, both phase one and phase two. And um, his research has been very well supported by the National Institutes of Health, NSF, and private uh, foundation. And so I don't want to take more time from uh, uh, our amazing speaker. So I'll hand over uh, to Peter, who's going to tell us about, uh, who's going to be talking to us about molecular imaging and cellular programming in immunoengineering. Peter? You can share your slide now. Okay. Let's see. Can you see my slides? Uh, just put them on slides, so oh, good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, you know, thanks uh, Alice for this, uh, you know, beautiful platform and the invitation for the uh, talk and also Martin for the wonderful introduction. Uh, today, I'm very, very privileged and honored to be able to share my work. So I will basically talk about a couple recent work in the lab specifically on molecular engineering and cellular reprogramming in immunoengineering. So in my lab, we basically do two things. One, we try to engineer molecular sensors put into cell and we can visualize what cells are thinking, how they you know, change their process whenever they engage with the neighbors or environment. The second, we try to re-engineer cells using molecular tools so that we can control them. For example, we can guide the immune cells to recognize and attack tumor. So I will you know, separate this talk into uh, like three main uh, sections. One, I would like to introduce some of the work or in our lab on molecular imaging, how we can understand and visualize molecular events in living cells. And later on, I will switch to some uh, reprogramming work. So in our lab, the main tool we use to visualize molecular activity is based on a concept so-called fluorescence, resonance, energy transfer, FLAT. So here we have two fluorescent proteins, as you can see on the left. It's CLP stands for cyan fluorescent protein, YP stands for yellow fluorescent protein. And these two can serve uh, as a FLAT pair 
CFP as a donor, YP as acceptor. And they can be connected by a phosphor amino acid binding domain and a substrate peptide. So this one molecule can serve as a sensor. So the idea is basically when you look at this sensor, in the beginning, this donor and acceptor will be close to each other. Excitation of the donor will have emission from the acceptor. Now, when this sensor is put into cell and there's activation of kinase, this enzyme will phosphorylate the substrate peptide. And this will cause a separation of the donor and the acceptor because the phosphorylated substrate peptide can bind to the phosphoric amino acid binding domain. And therefore, this donor acceptor are on the different uh, positions. Now, if you look at this bar sensor again, you will see mainly cyan color. If you take the ratio between these two, you will get uh, index. This index will represent the kinase activity. If the kinase is high, the index will be high. And uh, if the kinase is low, the index will be low. So using this concept we have applying to living cells, in this case, you can see two HeLa cells. Uh, in the beginning, they are lighter blue because the index is low and the kinase is low. And we can add the growth factor to the medium and stimulate the signaling cascade, particularly for a SARC kinase activation. And you can see the color change. Now I want to play the movie. You can see the color change and you can see the nuclear change much slower. And we can wash out and you can see the signal quench down and we can stimulate again. And you can see the second wave of activation. So this is basically very exciting. However, uh, there's a one weakness. The sensitivity of this bar sensor is typically not that good, like 10, 20%. So we recently developed a new platform. We tried to use a library screening, screening like a tens of millions of different uh, mutants and uh, select the best bar sensor, uh, giving us the you know, most sensitive you know, readout. So the idea is basically we can create the bar sensor library and put into memory cell and then using uh, fax machine to separate the cells with the best change before and after stimulation. And then we collect those cells and uh, select their uh, genomic material and send for sequencing. And using sequencing to identify which biosensor mutants give us the best change. And indeed, this technology worked and we now can improve the sensitivity of the so-called ZAP70 flat biosensor several folds higher in detecting the signals. So this allow us, as you can see on the image on the top, we can use the TCR signaling to drop onto the lipids and monitor the activation of TCR. As you can see, this is the flat ratio image showing the structure and activation of this uh, uh, TCR ZAP70 activity. You can see very nicely uh, structure the distribution as you can see at the cell periphery, there's an activation of ZAP70 in the center is also high. Now, if you use the same bar sensor to visualize the uh, car activation and drop onto the lipid bar layer, and you can see in general on the right side, it's laterally disorganized, suggesting possibly TCR signaling are more structurally well organized. This may also explain possibly the TCR, if you consider one against one to the car molecule, they are much more potent and efficient. And of course, this uh, improved bar sensor can also allow us to visualize when a tumor cell engage with the CAR T. For example, in the bottom uh, images, as you can see, we can co-culture the tumor cell together with the CAR T cells and using flash signal to monitor the ZAP70 activity in the uh, CAR T cells. And the bottom is the acting signals. Uh, you can see the co-localization and uh, also see the interface between tumor cell and T cell. There's a high activity of this ZAP70. So this allows us to, you know, really visualize the molecular events in your system. And recently, we are also interested in visualizing the epigenetics, chromatin dynamics. We know that the genome are regulated and organized by chromatin and the histo. Uh, structures. So in this case, you can see the histone has this uh, histone core to form a nucleosome and the genome material wrapping around it. And uh, this histone core has the tail sticking out, which can be modified by acetylation, methylation, or phosphorylation. And this 
modification can tell whether the chromatin should be open or closed. And this would determine whether the local uh, genome uh, area will be open or closed, therefore control the genetic activity. So you can imagine, although the genome information could be similar, but because of the modification or the histone tail are different, they can control the gene in different way. So we want to use our flat bar sensor to do the same thing, to track at a single cell level, how epigenetics and chromatin are dynamically controlled. So the idea is somewhat similar. We create a bar sensor cons uh, consisting of a donor and acceptor and also a bonding domain. And these we can directly fuse to a H3 histone tail. And the histone tail can allow this cobalt sensor to be inserted into this nucleosome so that whenever there is a methylation happening at the tail or the histone, and this will cause a conformational change. So as you can see in the picture in the beginning, this cobalt sensor, because a long linker in between the donor and acceptor, they will be somewhat stretched, extended. So there's no flat. When the methylation happened at the histone tail, this methylated residue will start to grab the HP1 and therefore ECLP and YPAD will get together and cause a flat change. And this will allow us to track the epigenetic histone methylation whenever it happened in cells. So Dr. Qingpen, now she already started her own lab in Shenzhen Bay uh, Laboratory. And uh, she basically invented this technology and allow us to visualize at single cell level how the H3K9 trimethylation is modified. For example, on the top panel of the uh, images, you can see uh, if we look from left to right, the left is the interface. You can see relatively hot color indicating a high level of H3K9 trimethylation. When the cell goes through the mitosis, there is a quench and reduction of this uh, epigenetic signal. And as soon as the cell finishing uh, the division, they quickly recover the epigenetics of H3K9 trimethylation. I want to play this movie. Uh, you can see in the beginning, interface relatively high. When they get into mitosis, there's a quench and there's a recovery quickly. Suggesting at a single cell level, this epigenetic histone modification is precisely controlled. These are all, you know, allowing us to visualize the molecular signals, but in general at the global level or the single cell in all the, all, uh, other in the nucleus or in the subtle uh, plasma. Uh, we also would be interested in visualizing the molecular events precisely at specific genome loci. Uh, it turns out to be a very challenging task. I have to admire the courage uh, of Professor, uh, Dr. Chimpen, who really, you know, uh, initiated the persistent way work it out. So in this technology, we found out it's quite uh, challenging, mainly because the copy number or the genome loci, they are very limited. Uh, in many cases, only one copy at one position, right? So very difficult to see those signals. If you compare to the RNA or the uh, proteins, typically they have tens or thousands of copies, and those basically can easy uh, to visualize. For genome loci, we have to utilize some kind of amplification system. So in this case, Qing developed this technology using DCAS9, carrying 24 repeats of some tag, and they can localize to a particular locus, wherever you want them to go. And then they can recruit SCFV, FKBP, and therefore, this will allow us the inducible recruitment to another, the last red uh, color labeled uh, component, which is FRB and cherry HP1 alpha. Upon the rapamycin addition, this red FRB and cherry HP1 alpha will be recruited through the FKBP FRB dimerization. Now you have many copies localized to the locus uh, position, and it turns out HP1 alpha has so called intrinsically disordered domain. So they can trigger phase separation and drop formation. And this will further amplify the signal by the condensation of multiple copies together. And this allows us to see those localized uh, genome loci in the uh, single cell. So as you can see uh, on the right side, we have images in the beginning without this rapamycin, you can mainly see diffused image in the nuclear. 
upon rapamycin, you can see gradually increase and pick up all these signals at particular telomere sites. We can also use technology to visualize and detect MUC E3, as you can see on the left, on the second row of the images, the two dots can be clearly seen. And uh, if you take off SCADA-A or SCFVFKBP, everything will be gone, suggesting the signal is quite specific. So this MUC4 E3 has multiple repeats, which allow us to have better detection capability. We also tried in other more difficult loci, for example, IL-1B, which is important for immune reaction, but it only has one repeat, like a, it's so-called non-repetitive uh, genome loci. And we can see the uh, system still allow us to visualize these two dots clearly, suggesting now the signal amplification is pretty good with the system. And MUC 4.1, similarly, it's also a non-repetitive genome loci, we can still see these two dots clearly. And if we take out the SCADNA or SCFV, FKBP, everything will be gone. Suggesting again, the system is very specific. And because the HP1 alpha is somewhat, uh, you know, genome uh, suppressor, uh, these basically further allow us to manipulate the local gene expression whenever you target this Simba uh, complex into a particular genome loci, it can suppress the gene in the neighboring area. And we can verify using the RNA-seq, as you can see on the left, uh, these are the controls. On the right, whenever we trigger using rapamycin, the aggregation of those HP1 alpha, we can suppress the local genes. And this is basically done by Dr. Qingpen and Dr. Adam Zilianhuang. They will call this system. Now we can have a tool allowing us to not only visualize and track at a particular genome loci, but also suppress and control the gene expression in these areas. If you are interested in those kind of you know, uh, uh, tasks or visualization of the genome, we'll be very happy to collaborate and see whether we can formulate a team. So uh, in the remaining slides, I would like to switch gear to you know, really uh, introduce some of the work on the uh, reprogramming side, mainly because we, you know, want to control the cell so that we can guide their functions for a certain purpose of the applications. First, I would like to uh, introduce an interesting, you know, so-called machinery molecule design for the sensing and acutating to re-engineer a uh, macrophage for tumor eradication. So this I have to thank my daughters. Uh, I was watching this movie together with them and I saw all this uh, Wally molecule has a very cool sensor and it activated together. At that time, we only played with the sensor. So we thought maybe we should integrate these two together so that this whole you know, molecule can do two things, uh, you know, sensing and activation at the same time. So we thought maybe we can design our sensor, but introduce a domain which can integrate with the cellular control cascade so that whenever the sensor detect a specific signal, it will cause a flight change, of course, and it will also trigger a molecular cascade to control the cellular activation. And uh, this is a concept, and we choose one molecule, SHIP2, to demonstrate whether this concept works. So we know this SHIP2 molecule is an enzyme it has a phosphatase domain on the bottom, but it's locked by its two uh, intramolecular SS2 domains, NSS2 and CSS2. So although this enzyme is in the cell, it has no function. Now we think maybe we can insert our bar sensor at the end terminal with this acceptor, a long linker and a donor, and they are peptide containing 2000 sites. So this will form a sensor activator. The idea is in the beginning, if there's no like enzymatic kinase activity, these 2000 sites will not be phosphorated and you'll only see mainly the donor signal because the acceptor is far away. Now, when the activation of the kinase is occurring in a cell, for example, in some tumor cells, their kinase activity is high and they can phosphorate the 2000 sites and this caused the bonding. Oops, sorry, I don't know what's going on. 
these, these will cause the phosphorylation of the 2000 sites. And then these peptides will flip over to bind to the SS2 domains. And this will bring the donor and accept it together and cause a flight change. And uh, this will be a sensing part. And because these two phosphorylated thousand sites occupy the two SS2 domains, now this phosphorylated domain can no longer hold itself. This will be exposed and become active. So this will allow us to have one molecule, which can do two things, right? Sensing the kinase activity to cause the color change and also expose the phosphorylated domain to activate the cell. So we first demonstrate this uh, sensor part in living cells. We introduce this into the cell and stimulate the kinase activity. And you can see the color change in this fibroblast nicely. Uh, again, you can see clearly outside the nuclear is changing much more than inside the nucleus. And if we mutate the, this uh, uh, sensor activator, the 2000 sites, and you can see all these you know, response will be gone suggesting the response is behaving as we designed. And then at that time, we you know, started to think what could be the uh, usage of these uh, molecules. And we found out in a lot of these uh, tumor cells, they have this so-called don't eat me signal. Actually, this don't eat me signal is mediated by CD47, which is a very famous molecule in red blood cells. That's why red blood cells in our body, since they born, to their uh, death, it will last for 120 days because the CD47 uh, signal telling the macrophage not to eat them. So we tried to utilize this system and use it to treat the tumor because tumor cell also use this CD47 don't eat me signal to prevent the macrophage from eating them. So our design is basically, we know in the macrophage, there is so-called FC gamma receptor, which can be guided by the antibody, which can recognize the antigen on the tumor surface, and they will trigger the phagocytosis mediated by thousand phosphorations. Uh, this CD47 on the other side, they will engage with another receptor on the macrophage and turn, turn on thousand phosphorations and recruit a negative regulation. And then this will stop the macrophage. So essentially, as you can imagine, macrophage have two uh, sets of the signals. One is FC gamma mediated thousand phosphorylation. Another is SERP alpha mediated uh, negative regulation. So you can imagine this is like a car. It has engine, can keep moving, guided by FC gamma receptor to kill. On the other side, they has a brake SERP alpha, which can be stopped, uh, you know, uh, through the CD47. So we think maybe we should re-engineer this uh, break receptor sub alpha through our smart molecule sensing activation machinery molecule. So the design is basically we can re-engineer this break sub alpha receptor. So we will insert our machinery molecule into the tail of this sub alpha. So the idea is whenever the tumor cell try to use CD47 to engage with the sub alpha, try to stop the macrophage it actually will cause phosphorylation and recruit all designed machinery molecule and open all designed molecule, therefore help macrophage to eat further. So this basically we demonstrate it indeed works. So as you can see, we are showing two movies on the right. On, on the top is basically a re-engineered the macrophage. The blue color represent the sensor uh, component to show whether the activation is ongoing. And uh, you can see when we drop tumor cells on top and uh, you can see the tumor cell will come and you can see the color change, right? That's sensing part and it will basically trigger the macrophage to eat quickly and the tumor cell will be gone and everything will be quenched. On the bottom, so the, by the way, this is my favorite movie I want to play twice. Uh, in this case, on the bottom, we purposely deleted the activation domain. So this macrophage is re-engineered, but they can only see, they cannot help the eating. So you can see the tumor cell be dropping and they can come and you can see more and more come, right? But they cannot be eaten. You can see the engagement and the sensor detection. So this is basically really, you know, uh, showing that we can re-engineer the macrophage using these genetic tools to help the macrophage to eat further. 
And we further utilize this technology and, and apply it for in vivo. And we can see the in vivo uh, 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 effect also is there using this, we call it snap uh, engineered monocyte, a macrophage. We can suppress the tumor much better than the controls. So this is the work done or lead by Dr. Uh, Jason and Dr. Lele. Uh, I don't know why. Okay, yeah, the name are there. Dr. Jason, who is currently a professor at uh, Zhejiang University. So they basically initiated this work and made it, you know, uh, to the end. And uh, the idea is basically now we can engineer this automated molecule, which have a sensor, you know, keep closing inside the, the intracellular space or the cell. And whenever they detect a signal, they can help the cell to fight and uh, kill the tumor. And we demonstrate using macrophage to achieve this goal. So these are all automated. We consider this as a molecular version of Tesla car or Google car, right? But sometimes we know if everything is automated, it's not necessarily always good, right? Because if there's some component broken, we cannot do anything. So we are thinking maybe we can engineer uh, molecules which can be controlled by external signal, for example, using light or ultrasound. So first I would like to introduce uh, the light controllable molecular uh, you know, regulators. Uh, this, I have to introduce this uh, CAR-T concept because this is a very enriched area and uh, I want to demonstrate using our technology, we can make the CAR-T controllable using light, for example. So CAR-T we know it's essentially uh, uh, engineered the T cell. You basically introduce a CAR containing a single chain uh, antibody on the surface and transmembrane domain, uh, activation domain inside. So the engineer, the T cell, if we collect from patient uh, after engineering and put back into patient, this car can recognize the antigen on the tumor cell. And this will allow the T cell to go to the tumor cell, engage and got activated, and they can start the killing job for the tumor cell. And this is a very uh, simple concept and it worked really beautifully. And uh, the first uh, Emma White was uh, rescued by Dr. Kao Jung starting in 2012. Uh, she had advanced leukemia with this CAR-T therapy. Now she happily lived, uh, you know, now 10, day, 10 years. I should update this uh, picture, you know, it's only nine years at that time. Uh, and this become a revolution. And now we know there are six commercially available product in the market, uh, mostly, you know, successful treating uh, blood cancers, but for solid tumor, it still has some you know major problem. The one of the most critical one, in my opinion, is on target of tumor toxicity. As you can imagine, you know when the CAR T cell is reintroduced into patient, it go everywhere, right? They will attack the tumor, but they can also attack other tissue or organ when they express similar kind of you know uh, antigen, even in minor amount. So for the blood cancer, we are very lucky. CD19 is quite clean, you know, antigen. You can kill the tumor and sometimes, of course, overkill some of the B cells, but that's fine because bone marrow can regenerate the B cells, you know, uh, so it's not lethal. But for solid tumor, so far, I don't think there's a perfect antigen yet. So this will cause a danger. These CAR T cell, after they put into the patient, they go attack the tumor. At the same time, they can also attack those normal organ or tissue. And indeed, there are cases like a patient died, although the tumor disappeared, uh, you know, basically because of CAR-T attack those critical organ like cardio, uh, heart or liver or like a brain. So we are thinking maybe we can use our engineering approach to control these CAR-T, for example, and activate them only at the tumor site. So all controllable CAR-T, they can go everywhere in the body, no problem. We only activate them where the tumor, whenever they get away, they have less you know, uh, activity and therefore they will not harm other areas and normal organ or tissue. So we basically start to think and engineer these so-called light controllable CAR-T. So in this scenario, we have three you know, genetic motif uh, two of them we call the regulators. One is essentially uh, the controller for car or reporter at, in this case. So we have a regulator one, we call it 
the bounding domain DB and the light uh, sensitive uh, diamondization domain CRB1 and a switchable motif BIL uh, NLS. So basically, this switch motif has this nuclear localization motif embedded uh, in the beginning. When light is shining onto it, this BINLS will expose and expose its nuclear localization motif, allowing this whole thing to go to the nuclear. And this will allow the DNA bounding domain to find this inducible promoter. And this light at the same time will also activate the diamondization between the CRB1 and the CRY2. Oh, by the way, this TA representing a transcription activator, we keep this CRY2 and TA in the nucleus so that they are separated from the DNA bounding domain uh, before the light. Now, after light, this CRB1 and the CRY2 diamondize, and the net result would be, oops, I don't know why it skipped. Net result will be the CRB1 CRY2 diamondize will bring the transcription activator together to the DNA bounding domain to the inducible promoter. Now this transcription activator can start to, you know, uh, induce the expression or uh, the car or a reporter, whichever you want to insert into a gene cassette. So we demonstrate this technology works. As you can see, uh, you know, we can demonstrate use light, it can control this molecule to go to nuclear. And if we stop, it will come out. We can use light to turn on again to push them into nuclear, and then you can do that many, many times. Whenever light is on, they go to nuclear to have access to the uh, genome material and the DNA to control the gene. And uh, as you can imagine, these can allow us to translate to control the gene activities. As you can see on the right, before light, no gene expression. After light, we can see the expression nicely. So this is a, a movie showing the light can control the gene and we can further translate this into the in vivo application. So we create this light box, light controller box using uh, like LED to patch to the tumor site of the mice and this connect to the controller box. And we can use these to control the light pattern precisely. For example, every 30 seconds, we only activate one second so that it's a paused light stimulation. And uh, this is a blow up image. And then we can use this to test in animals uh, on the right uh, and up right corner. You can see the mice, we keep them in the dark. Even you introduce light controllable cells, uh, you don't see any you know, uh, uh, gene activation. On the right side, you can see before the light stimulation, no gene activation. After light stimulation, you can see the gene expression. We can reach like 20, 30 folds upon light in, uh, in vivo. Now, finally, we want to test whether this light controllable uh, uh, signal and the cells or particular CAR T cells can be used to control the tumor growth. So we have three groups on the right side, we have the tumor we inject uh, into the mice. You can monitor they grow nicely on the right side after 16 days. And we do the second group of the control. We introduce tumor cells first and then introduce light controllable CAR T. But in this case, we keep everything in the dark. So the light controllable CAR T will not be activated. And you can see the tumor grows still pretty well. And the, on the last, we introduce light controllable CAR T and then introduce, well, first we have to introduce tumor first, right? Let them grow for a couple of days. Then we introduce light controllable CAR T. And then in this case, we activate them using light. And you can see clearly, you know, this light controllable CAR T can suppress the tumor growth. One of mice possibly, you know, feeling itchy and by the cable and run away, uh, we lost the one data. But the result was still, you know, clear, right? Upon the light, we can suppress the tumor drastically comparing to the control groups. So this is done by, uh, again, Dr. Adam Zilian Huang, together with uh, Dr. Yichen Shelly Wu. Uh, I forgot to uh, paste the pictures here, but I will show later. So these are light controllable CAR T cells, very nice, allowing us to control the tumor. 
in vivo. Uh, although you know there's still one drawback because light cannot penetrate deep, so we can treat this like skin cancer uh, nicely, but uh, it will have difficulty if we are dealing with deep tissue uh, controls. So then we start to think ultrasound. Ultrasound can allow us to penetrate very deep, right? Tens of centimeters, not a problem. So we thought maybe we can use this system to control the CAR-T. Uh, so we know that ultrasound is essentially a mechanical wave. It can penetrate very deep into the tissue. Uh, if you can focus the energy of this ultrasound, you can even shatter the glass. So the energy level can be tuned uh, nicely. So we start to collaborate with uh, Dr. Kirk Shung, now uh, retired, but he was a professor at the USC. So he helped us to establish this ultrasound activation system. So in this case, we basically integrate the ultrasound and the frozen microscope together so that we can use ultrasound to activate the cell and using frozen microscope to monitor the response. And we first utilize the micro bubble concept to amplify the ultrasound signal because micro bubble has air inside. And if you put the micro bubble into the, you know, cartridge dish, it has liquid outside. So the impedance of the ultrasound between the air and the liquid, they have very large difference. So this will allow us to amplify the ultrasound signal. Essentially, when the ultrasound compression wave comes, it will shrink the micro bubble. When the ultrasound wave passes by, the micro bubble will expand. So this ultrasound wave comes will cause a micro bubble to vibrate mechanically. So this will amplify the signal. So we engineer a system to utilize these to amplify the ultrasound signal and translate into mechanical stimulation of the cell. So in this case, we first engineered the cell with the piezo one mechanical sensitive channel. Uh, you probably know uh, Adam Patapotian, uh, Potian, who you know is our neighbor in Scripps Research Institute. He won the Nobel Prize because this the piezo one uh, discovery. Uh, we collaborated with him. He was very nice, like uh, seven, eight years ago. He shared with us, you know, this construct so that we can introduce into hex cells. And then we use IR micro bubble and coated with stripped abdomen and the biotin and the antibody. And this antibody can physically couple the air micro bubble to the mechanical sensor uh, piezo one. So whenever ultrasound comes, it will vibrate this micro bubble. It will then mechanically open the piezo one. As we know, inside the cell, there's about 100 nanomolar calcium. Outside is typically millimolar calcium. So whenever this mechanical signal comes, it will open the piezo wall, allowing calcium to go in. And we use bar sensor to monitor that in the microscope. And you can see before the ultrasound comes, it's quite blue, suggesting low calcium level. After 10 seconds ultrasound, you can really see very nice uh, calcium signal, it's uh, like getting red, right? And after 40 seconds, it's coming down. And this will further allow us to, you know, basically demonstrate like uh, indeed the quantified results show very nice induction. And if you take off micro bubble or piezo wall or chelate the calcium outside cell, everything will be gone. Clearly indicating the system is quite specific. But of course, uh, controlling calcium is not our goal. We really want to control the gene. And we know calcium can activate calcium urine, which is a phosphatase. And phosphatase can dephosphate a transcription activator, which in the beginning or, to, or at the rest state is phosphorated. It, is, it stays in the cytoplasm. And when it's dephosphorated by the calcium urine, the in fat will go to the nuclear. This will allow us to engineer an inducible promoter and receive this nuclear localization signal in fact to control a gene, for example, a reporter GFE or a car gene, whichever you want. So we test whether this concept indeed worked. And as you can see, after we engineer this, you know, a hex cell with a PS1 a fused to TD tomato, and you can see these are engineer cells. And without ultrasound, no GLP will be produced. But upon ultrasound stimulation, we can see they can turn on the calcium and also 
the production reporter gene, suggesting this system indeed works. So this work uh, was uh, you know, done by uh, Dr. Yi Japan, uh, who currently is a, like a principal scientist in a local biotech company, Faith Therapeutics, you know, specifically focusing on CAR T uh, therapy. So this work is also give us some, you know, like uh, encouragement. However, we are still not happy yet, mainly because we still need to use a marker bubble. And in vivo, we know it's more difficult if you want to use a marker bubble to treat tumor. So we thought whether we can directly control the genes and the CAR-T in vivo using ultrasound without a marker bubble. And we know that there are already, you know, uh, available approach in hospitals and clinics, so-called MRI-guided HALF. HALF stands for High Intensity Focused Ultrasound. They can directly use you know, high intensity focused ultrasound to burn the tissue and kill them. So we thought this is quite brutal, right? Probably it will burn the, the you know, tissue as well as the nerve or blood vessel all around and cause a lot of pain for the patient. We thought maybe we could do better job using all controllable gene and CAR T so that we can use a much, much weaker uh, signal and a lower temperature to help the tumor killing, but also don't cause too much damage. And actually, you know, we also talked to this uh, uh, pro proton tos tosa, you know, probe system. Uh, they basically engineer this uh, prostate cancer treatment using ultrasound, but still using this burning technology to heat up the whole, you know, prostate, the tumor and kill them all. And of course this caused a lot of, you know, inconvenience, right, for the patients. So then we start to design a, you know, regulator, which can allow this ultrasound to only lower the, the only raise the temperature to a lower level, like 43 degree. And uh, this will already enough to trigger, for example, some transcription uh, regulator, like a heat shock factor. And they can go to a, you know, nuclear and bind to a heat shock promoter to drive the gene. So we basically engineer this heat shock promoter driving a reporter to see whether this concept would work. And uh, as you can see, indeed, it worked pretty nicely. On the left, you can see after the cell is engineered with all induced for promoter, uh, at a 37 degree, no gene product will be on. At the 43 degree, you can see the gene production clearly showing up. And even better, because ultrasound can be precisely controlled in terms of time, so you can easily create different kind of pattern for the temporal control. So this we utilize this uh, feature to show that indeed we can create this so-called short paused ultrasound stimulation. For example, in the middle, you can see we only stimulate for five minutes with laterally, you know, low temperature for this three degree, repeat for three times. We can turn on the gene. Sorry. Uh, we can turn on the gene very nicely, you know, even better than this continuous uh, pattern of the heat. So this is very important because we learned that these primary uh, human T cells collect from patient or, uh, you know, human subject, they are very delicate. So if you heat for a long time, they cause damage to these CAR T cells and they become less functional. So this short pause ultrasound pattern will allow us to activate the gene like it for the patient, it's gonna be local, you know, warm, right? And this will also be short paused. So it's kind of, you know, pause the feeling of this local area. This supposedly should not cause any damage. So we, we demonstrate this concept worked to control the CAR-T as well. So in this system, we create this dual promoter gene cassette, one, PGK, which is a constitutive promoter driving the M cherry reporter to allow us to see which cell has been engineered. And we also have a, a second P shock promoter inducible uh, gene cassette. And this will allow us to drive the car to be produced, which is you know, connected to an EGFP reporter so that we can know where the car is localized. And the, this is the control. We introduce this gene cassette into the T cells. And without ultrasound, you can see the uh, engineer cells with M cherry. You don't see the you know car production. With ultrasound, we can clearly see the uh, 
production of this GLP reported on the cell surface. You can see the ring structure suggesting they are on the surface nicely. So these are all in vitro demonstrated to works. We further want to apply them for in vivo animal studies. So we first engineered integrated the system, uh, integrating a uh, focused ultrasound so that they can control the temperature in mice. And these temperature can be monitored by a uh, integrated MRI system. And this MRI can provide the signal and control the power of the ultrasound so that the ultrasound power can be precisely tuned to maintain a st uh, stable level so that temperature in the focused area will be maintained uh, precisely. Uh, these are the images I just wanna show you how the system works. Uh, the left is on the top view. You can see the ultrasound transducer array and uh, the right side is the side view. You can see the ultrasound beams can be guided and steered to focus left and right or you know, in the Z direction, wherever you want, essentially, if you are talking about mice, right? It can cover everywhere. And we can use MRI to visualize the temperature distribution clearly showing in this location. And uh, this system uh, works. And when we introduce the uh, ultrasound controllable you know, uh, cells, and we can see without ultrasound treatment, you can see no gene production with ultrasound treatment, 10 minutes already turn on the gene. And we can also do short pause the stimulation. Now in this case, twice we short paused five minutes stimulation already turn on the gene production pretty nicely. So then we try to use this system to test whether ultrasound controllable CAR T can indeed do the job to suppress the tumor. We first utilize a simple model, lymphoma tumor model. We introduce two lymphoma tumors or uh, same mice, uh, left and right. And then we introduce uh, ultrasound controllable CAR T on both sides, but only activate the left side, leaving the right side as a control. And the result was very encouraging. Just one dose of the ultrasound stimulation, we can already see a very clear separation between the treated group versus the control. And these are the images, as you can see on the left, these are the mice treated with ultrasound. On the right is a control. And uh, Dr. Shelly Wu was uh, particular, you know, careful. She always do the exact same mice, like the left, for example, in this case, left for the ultrasound treatment, the right without ultrasound, these are the same mice, left and right, left and right, exactly on the same mice. And you can see in the beginning at day four, they are similar in size. After 18 days, the separation was very clear. So this is a lymphoma model, relatively simple for, to get us started. We further demonstrate this concept in real solid tumor models. Uh, again, the same experiment, we introduced two tumors, then introduced ultrasound, controllable CAR T on both sides, only actuate on left side. And this is we tested in prostate cancer model. Again, one dose ultrasound treatment already caused a very clear separation. Again, you can see the same mice left and right. After 18 days, the separation was very clear. And we expect we, if we can do multiple treatment of these uh, mice using ultrasound, we perhaps will be able to see even more suppression power and hopefully eradicate uh, the tumor once for all. Then we further demonstrate this ultrasound controllable CAR-T indeed provide us a much better safety comparing to the market available you know, CAR-T because they are continuously active, right? So we demonstrate this concept, introduce two tumors, again, in the same mice on the left and right. And the right mice, we are using it to mimic uh, normal organ or tissue, but expressing the same antigen. So we introduce the like constitutive CAR-T like, as a standard CAR-T, only on the left side. So on the left, we call the pro, uh, proximal tumor. On the right, we call it distal tumor. And uh, sorry, I just don't want to get distracted. Uh, you can see on the lower left corner, the monitoring of the size of the tumor. You can see the proximal tumor quickly, you know, never get up because the CAR T already killing them, right? They never grow. And the distal side, you can see the grow in the beginning but gradually also being eradicated. 
which indicate this standard CAR T is very dangerous. If you have a normal organ or tissue on the far you know, side in the same mice, they will be attacked. They will be killed by the same standard uh, you know, CAR T because they migrate uh, over and uh, attack them. Now, if we look at all focused ultrasound controllable CAR T, do the same experiment. We have two tumor on two sides, only inject all ultrasound controllable CAR T on the left side and then activate by the ultrasound. You can see the proximal tumor, of course, will be suppressed by this ultrasound controllable CAR T. On the uh, distal side, this you know, tumor grow pretty well, suggesting if it is a normal tissue organ, even expressing the similar kind of antigen, they have no problem. So this technology really demonstrate the safety and the precision of our technology. And this is published the last year. And uh, you know, we are lucky they select our technology as the cover article. So this is basically uh, our dream. We really hope with uh, our technology, we would be able to integrate the whole thing, allow us to visualize uh, in real time, what's going on in the cell, you know, in terms of genetics and epigenetics. And this will allow us to detect the signal and hopefully integrate with deep learning technology, allow us to control the uh, uh, ultrasound or other external signals. And this will utilize the sensor and the genetic transducer to control the cells to behave as we want. And the right lower corner picture really is our dream, we hope. In the future, we can have a, a jacket using uh, soft electronics and the transducers ultrasound. And this can be controlled by like cellular phones with app and the uh, patient can you know, nicely have a massage you know, every you know, two or three days for five minutes or 10 minutes. And this will allow the control of this uh, tumor uh, conveniently. Uh, I have to uh, you know, thank my lab members I think I already, you know, basically introduced some of them already in the uh, earlier slides. I just want to, you know, highlight again, Dr. Mingqing Ouyang, uh, Dr. Uh, Liu Wei Long, uh, Long Wei Liu, uh, Dr. Ming and uh, Qing Pen. Those basically work out the biosensor part of the work. And uh, Dr. Jie Sung and the Lei Lei work out this uh, macrophage engineering project and Dr. Adam Zilian Huang and Molly Allen work out the light controllable CAR T. And uh, Dr. Yi Japan and Shirley Wu worked out the uh, ultrasound controllable CAR T system. And we have wonderful collaborators. And also, I have to thank the funding support from NIH and uh, you know, all the other support from uh, UC San Diego and Department of Bioengineering. I have to thank you for your attention. I hope. I'm not over the time yet. And I'll see already Martin is uh, showing up. So uh, I guess my time should be up. I will be happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wang. Uh, fantastic talk. Uh, great, many, many ideas, uh, very diverse research portfolio. Uh, and it's, it's, it's people like you who make this platform uh, what it is. So thank you. Uh, so Thank to you. continue this, um, there's one question that came from the audience, and this is from uh, Lin uh, uh, at Chengdu, and uh, he says, thanks, Professor Wang, very inspiring talk for the ultrasound treatment, how uh, deep it can go and will the bone and other organs affect the results? Basically about that's interference. All, yeah, that's an outstanding uh, question. Thank you very much for asking that. So typically for soft tissue, uh, ultrasound can you know, reach very deep, right? 10 centimeter, 15 centimeter, uh, all possible. Uh, but I agree, you, know, you mentioned the very important component. Uh, ultrasound will be very vulnerable for some like impedance, you know, uh, strong kind of component in the tissue like bone or lung, for example, right? They have very you know, different interface between the materials, right? Between air or soft tissue or bone, which is very dense and the soft tissue. So whenever these are encountered, they will reflect a lot of ultrasound signals. So this will indeed will cause some reduction of the power. But actually we are now using full power of the ultrasound 
you know, we are basically using very, you know, small component of the ultrasound signal. So it's, you know, understandable if we can increase the power of the ultrasound, we should be able to overcome all this refraction of the bone or air bubble in the lung. Uh, this should be doable, although we need to be, you know, doing some kind of uh, pre-calibration so that you can still focus the beams uh, to a certain position, you know, overcoming those reflections. These are doable, but indeed it will create more like uh, effort to reach a high precision. Thank you. Okay. Oh, actually, I, I just got another question from one of my students who's, uh, from my group who's watching. And uh, they're asking, um, is there a possibility to combine uh, ultrasound with uh, local light for photoacoustic uh, amplification of what you're doing? Oh, that's a great Basically, question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, photoacoustic and ultrasound. I think it would be beautiful if it's possible. You know, uh, I have to confess, I'm not really you know the expert in photo photoacoustics, right? But it would be great if we can use a photoacoustics to visualize the you know field, and then use the ultrasound to control to integrate these two systems together. You can visualize and control at the same time, right? That would be mm -hmm. wonderful. We will be very happy to collaborate. Although I don't know how to do that yet, but I assume uh, in principle it's doable. It'll probably require a lot of effort, though. Okay, very good, very good. So um, the, I'm, I'm going to now introduce our panel, and uh, the the first panelist is Anthony Chen. Um, professor Chen is an associate professor at PKU. Uh, he actually graduated from uh, UC San Diego, uh, both uh, BS and MS. And then uh, he went to uh, UPenn for PhD and then had a postdoctoral training at uh, NI National Institute of Standards and, and Technology, NIST, and then uh, National Institute of, uh, of Health, NIH, uh, before moving to, to Peking. His research interest is in the fields of nucleic acid technology nucleic acid nanotechnology, and single uh, molecule life cell imaging. Our next panelist is uh, uh, Professor Zhong. Uh, professor Zhong is a, a full professor at uh, PKU. And uh, he's, uh, he's been at PKU for some time, having uh, received his BS and PhD um, and, and, and did some postdoc in the Department of Elect Electronics at Peking University. Uh, um, he, <clears throat> he was promoted to associate professor in 06 and in 2011 uh, became full professor. His interest is in interdisciplinary studies involving mechanics, materials, micro, nanotechnology, and biomedicine, uh, including um, mechanomaterials, organoid engineering, and microfluidics, uh, and, and organs on chip. Uh, our next uh, panelist uh, is uh, Professor Ki. She is the chair uh, of the Biomedical Committee in the Chinese Society of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics, uh, Executive Council Member of the Chinese Society of Biomedical Engineering, and Council Member of the Chinese Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. She's a distinguished uh, pro professor at uh, Shanghai Jiatong University, uh, and her research focuses on mechanisms on which mechanical stimuli induces biological res response and vascular remodeling. And with that, we uh, can now get into the panel and I invite uh, our panelists to engage our speaker. Uh, on, uh, if you have any question, any comments, and uh, I'm not gonna pick anyone, so whoever has, a, has something to ask, they can go ahead. Can I ask the question first? Sure. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dr. Wang, for such an interesting work and excellent work. 
uh, especially the work is uh, systematically based on the single cell from the single cell to the uh, end model in vivo, the multi-scale excellent example. And well, probably I have two questions. First is uh, about the histone modification. In this part, you show an excellent example of the methylation on the histone uh, three K9, right? Uh, and uh, my question is the biosensor binding on this site, whether it will change the function of this uh, modification of the histone. We all know that the uh, modification of histone is a very important epigenetic regulation uh, on the gene expression or um, many uh, important functions. Uh, the, the bending of the bell sensor, whether it will change the function of this modification or not, and whether you had uh, Another kind of bell sensors on the tail of histone three. Uh, there are many modifications uh, modifications on this side: the methylation, the uh, phosphorylation, and on different sides. Uh, I want to know that if you have another bell sensors to detect the other kind of modifications on this uh, the, on the histone, it will be very helpful. The first question is about this one. And the second question is also about the histone. And uh, I, I find that in the second part, you also have a bell sensor on the uh, DNA, on the gene. Uh, I, want, I wonder if you can combine the bell sensor on the histone and the sensor on the uh, DNA, whether the French technique can uh, used to detect the interaction between the histone and the DNA if it uh, will just give us another useful tool to detect the interaction between these two kind of uh, mo molecules in the cell. Mm, so probably you can give us some suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, these are you know, marvelous questions. Uh, some of them are just exactly what we are you know, doing in the lab you know, as the next step. Uh, for sure, you know, uh, the H3K9 trimethylation is very important right, for the you know, chromatin regulation. And uh, the biosensor may you know, affect if it's completely occupying the H3K9 trimethylation. Luckily, we found out in a single cell, before the DNA is duplicated, there are 30 million copy of H3 tail at a single cell level. After DNA is duplicated, that's 60 million copies. So the biosensor we introduce into cell will only occupy a very small portion of the, you know, the H3 tail. And therefore, at the moment, based on the Cellular assays, we observe, we did not see any, you know, functional change for the cell. Uh, maybe they will have some local, you know, uh, effect. We don't know yet. But at the global cellular behavior level, we don't see any modification. We can track the cell cycle and track them, you know, and monitor cell status. We cannot see any, you know, difference. That's one thing. And of course, we are also engineer different kind of uh, epigenetic biosensors. Uh, like H3K27 methylation, we also have one you know developed, and uh, we are also making like uh, acetylation bar sensors as well. Uh, currently, you know all these bar sensors, we are also trying to make them even more sensitive, you know, because in our lab, you know, because we are relatively familiar with fluorescence and flat, we can nicely track the molecular events. But for like relatively you know general kind of laboratories. Uh, it may be difficult because the sensitivity is not that high, right? So we are still making, you know, optimizations for these bar sensors. Hopefully we'll have more, you know, available for the community to use. That's the first question, right? Uh, the second question you mentioned about uh, the locus specific detection, right? Using this uh, like HP1, you know, droplet kind of approach. Uh, exactly, we are also, you know, we dreamed about, uh, you know, the next step, how we can use this technology to visualize not only the global epigenetic change, uh, you know, but also the locus or gene specific 
epigenetic change, right? So this combination definitely will be our goal. Currently, it's still ongoing. Uh, you know, how we can utilize this highlighted locus or low side position to visualize the local epigenetic changes. Uh, and the other component you mentioned is whether using this technology, we can study the interaction between histone modification and the gene segments, right? Yes. Uh, this is uh, in principle doable. Uh, I would think, you know, if we just combine them together simply, probably will give us some signals. But to create a really, you know, elegant, uh, you know, uh, detecting system, still, you know, may need some effort. Uh, we actually don't have a particular ongoing project directly, you know, targeting that, uh, but definitely doable. And uh, your suggestion actually gave us a stimulation. Now we have more to do, although we need to, uh, you know, now think about how we can get fund to support that project, you know. It definitely will be a very interesting project. We just need to convince the reviewer to give us money, you know, to do those, you know. Yeah, thank you for the question, beautiful ones. Thank you very much and looking forward for your just excellent and further work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I guess, uh, hi, Peter, um, that was, that was a very excellent. Hi, Anthony. Talk. Hi. Uh, so uh, I really learned a lot from your talk. And I just have two questions regarding the, uh, the engineer cells that you introduced to us. So the first question is, how long does it take to see a response after the activation at the gene expression level? So that's my first question. You know, of, of uh, all the maybe, biotech uh, that we created, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, you know, I, actually I'm getting old, right? So memory just decay, you know? So probably we can just one by one, maybe that's easier because it's hard to memorize, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes, you know, I forgot the first question when I answer the second. So mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, that's a great question again, right? Uh, depend on the signal uh, we are detecting for some of the like uh, kinase, uh, those are super fast, right? Like minutes. Uh, of course, calcium could be even faster, like, uh, you know, milliseconds or seconds. Uh, for some epigenetic changes, it's typically slower. Uh, you know, for example, for the cell cycle one, we can observe like uh, in 20 minutes, depending on where you are looking at, when they are at the interface between G2 and AM phase, then we can see the change like in 20 minutes. And of course, you know, in one hour or one and a half hour, you can see a you know complete change of the epigenetics. Uh, this actually so far is perhaps most dramatic change we observe in epigenetics. If we are using other stimulations, usually those will even take longer to observe uh, epigenetic change. It could be like a couple of hours. So it really depends on what signal we are talking about. You know, the time scale could vary quite big. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so for my second question, also related to the engineer cells that you created. So how are they compare against the normal wild type cells? And I, I guess, I mean, it is that you engineer new functions into these cells, but can you actually take away uh, some important functions from these cells as well during the engineering? That, that's a, again, outstanding question, right? First of all, you know, non-specific or undesired perturbation of the cell, uh, you know, we cannot deny sometimes biosensor if we directly introduce into the whole cell, they may cause some change. Uh, it's the same thing for GLP, right? GLP, you know, after it's invented, it, this is the same question people always come up, right? You know, when you introduce a foreign, you know, protein into a whole cell, whether you will perturb the cellular function. Uh, there's no question, something may be changed, but in general, you know, those are relatively inert protein. And uh, for some important function, uh, at least you always, you know, verify to make sure they will not perturb these important functions. For example, for the epigenetic biosensor we use, we typically also assess, for example, cell cycle or other cellular functions to make sure the Y type cell and or engineer cell they have similar functions. So therefore the monitor signal, hopefully they will match 
the you know uh, the host physiological process. And sometimes we also do the like a kinetic match. For example, we do Western blot uh, or the endogenous white type cell like a uh, methylation, right? And uh, compared to all bar sensor, detect the signals to see whether they are similar. Kinase bar sensor, we also do the same thing. You know, we, for example, for the SAC kinase, we also measure the phosphorylation or the substrate or the endogenous proteins compared to all bar sensor kinetics and uh, show they are similar. So those are all like calibration of the bar sensor when we engineer them and introduce into the cell. Uh, for other parts, you know, sometimes we want to purposely control the cell function. For those, obviously, we will, you know, try to change the cell function as we want. So these are different uh, aspects, uh, you know, we want them to happen, right? For those non-desired, non-specific signal, usually for the bar sensor engineering, that's the always the, the Sometimes it could be a difficult part, you know, you have to make sure the bar sensor is reporting exactly what you want without causing too much of the perturbation of the cell system. Hope I you know, answer your question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and one more talk, Peter. Hi, yeah, yeah, thank hi. you. Uh, I also have two questions. One is related to uh, your talk. I think uh, the flat uh, is a powerful tool for the for study the molecule uh, interaction. But uh, in your talk, uh, most of the data uh, the, the result is uh, uh, under the uh, 2D cell culture, uh, just the cell lie on the, the subject. Do you think flat can be used for the 3D culture or even in in vivo con condition. Yeah. yeah, that's a understanding question, right? This is also a question you know people ask quite often. Uh, currently, the frozen protein we are using uh, it's at the relatively short wavelength zone, like cyan and yellow. Uh, they are in general difficult to do in vivo because you know the short wavelengths can be easily observed by the tissue, right, or blood, you know. So it's a lot uh, difficult. But we are also engineering like more red shifted protein. Actually, we have one project collaborating with uh, Professor Jin Zhang, even using like a single frozen protein at the red zone to create the bar sensor, which will allow us to visualize at long wavelengths. And those perhaps will allow us to have better capability for in vivo imaging. We are actually, you know, writing a proposal for in vivo mm. imaging using fluorescent proteins, you know. So your question yeah. is just perfect. <laughs> Hopefully, we yeah. will be also excited, you know, using the bar sensor and the fluorescence to visualize molecular events in vivo. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, 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 is, uh, you, in your uh, data, is just a two-dimensional uh, image. Can use the uh, comfort or other uh, 3D uh, microscope to, to show the uh, 3D uh, interaction, not just yeah, that's uh, to, to uh, right. one slide. Yeah, that's also another outstanding question, right? Uh, yeah, currently we mostly use a you know, wide field epifluorescence microscope approach. Mainly, you know, uh, comparing to confocal microscope, we know confocal basically, you have a pinhole, right? You focus on the whole cell body and uh, only pick the signal from the thin layer or focal plane. So intrinsically, this design, you know, force you to use laterally high, you know, power to pump in enough for photon so that you can discard all the photon from the out focal plane signals only pick the yeah. focal plane signal, right? And this basically will cause quite a bit for the bleaching or, you know, like non-desired toxicity or these activated frozen proteins. And therefore we try to avoid that using wide field AP frozen uh, microscope, mainly because live cells, cells, particularly if you're working on primary cells, they are very sensitive to the light. So we try to minimize the photon pumping as much as we can and use a very sensitive camera to pick even limited copy of the photons, right? So we try to collect all the photons from the, you know, excited cell. That's why currently 
we are using the uh, wide field, but avoiding the confocal. Uh, with, hopefully, we can get more support to get this high-end microscope like light sheet microscope, right? And this perhaps will allow us to have 3D collection and also, you know, without too much of the photo bleaching, you know, problem. Live cell is, you know, relatively difficult compared to other like, you know, fixed cell examples. So uh, this actually would be a weakness. We don't have too much of the power at the moment to have 3D visualization to take sections or this. Did I answer your question, Chun Yang? I guess I, uh, his internet may have some issue. Yep. All right, I, I think I'm gonna jump in. Um, very, as, as I said, very interesting work, Peter. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to see I guess um, it's another. Marty. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Internet. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I can jump in to ask your questions, Peter. I couldn't wait. You know. Yeah. Uh. Yes. Yeah. It is very, very nice work. Actually, I learned a lot Hello? from your talk. Yeah. So, Martin. Yeah, I jump in to ask the questions. Okay. Sure. First. Sure. Yeah. I'm thinking that Peter, you taught in the first part. You have uh, sensors and actuators. Yeah, use as a tr uh, transducers. This was uh, right. uh, really, really good because we do a lot of things in MAMS. You know, we try and make the devices have sensor mm -hmm. actuator like that. Now you use a uh, bio stuff, right? So mm -hmm. uh, for my question here is, is that possible? You design all this kind of, you know, uh, reprogramming the cells or something like that, you know, like uh, these functions. How about the yield? Is that 100%? And uh, as I by chance. Oh, that's a great question. You know, uh, currently, yeah, we have not actually, you know, assessed that yet because we have microscope. So even there's a very low percentage, you know, microscope can allow us to see a single cell. So we actually did not worry too much about the efficiency, like what's the percentage of the cell response yet. But that definitely will be a great question, you know, in the future for therapeutic work, right? We want to have a high efficiency, 100% would be the best. Uh, uh, we could use like a flow cytometry to sort those successfully engineered cells uh, to enrich the efficiency. Uh, we have not done that yet, but it's definitely doable. Okay, great. Because normally, you know, we talk about we make mm -hmm. how many, you know, cell of the sensors as that, you know, this kind of occur work or some work. But I think in the bio stuff, yeah, that, that I don't know how to detect that, but I want to know about this. Okay, uh, very, very great. Uh, another question is for uh, you have a how, yeah, how did you push all these kind of fantastic research into the real applications. I saw you have some kind of uh, really good examples you show in the slides. So how you work with them? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, you know, I have to consider myself like uh, very fortunate. Right? I have wonderful like, you know, uh, students and the postdoc, they are just amazing, you know. Uh, I, I probably, you know, they're just doing way better than what I expected. Uh, they push this technology forward, you know, I'm just the one, you know, talking. Uh, so with these technologies, some of them definitely can be pushed to clinics. Actually, one of the uh, technologies, uh, as I showed earlier, using MRI guided ultrasound, those can be readily extended to the real, you know, clinical trials. Actually, we are talking to FDA to initiate some clinical trial studies, uh, mainly because the promoter we are using is from endogenous you know, gene segment. Uh, it's a heat shock promoter. And uh, MRI and uh, ultrasound has been well adapted into the hospital and clinics. So those two things can be readily integrated together. Oh, of course, CAR-T has been well you know, uh, established in the field, right? All these two systems integrate together should be able to allow us to 
just on the CAR-T transiently and locally so that we can have, you know, a lot of power to manipulate the tumor, control tumor, kill them without worrying that in the patients, there are other places, you know, they cause a problem, right? Which is the most difficult part because human physiology is so difficult. So if you don't have a precise control, your room will be very limited because if you want to kill the tumor, you worry about uh, you know causing damage for other places. Mm-hmm. So it's extremely difficult, and the body is so complicated with infection or bacteria or virus. Sometimes it happens, and uh, almost impossible to have perfect system if you don't worry about the you know spatial temporal resolution. Mm-hmm. So with all ultrasound controllable CAT, I would envision we eliminate a lot of barriers and therefore create a lot of room. We can use brutal pores, you know, combined together without causing too much of a concern. So I really have a high hope we will be able to push this technology to clinics soon. And other technology probably we are also thinking, you know, but maybe taking more, you know, effort. But this ultrasound and MI integrated system, we really have a high hope. Thank you very much. Yeah, Martin. Thanks, Alice. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry, sorry, Peter. I think my, my computer was running out of juice, so I had to plug it in. We figured. Um, yeah. yeah. So so the, the, my question was, uh, given the breadth of work and your experience in, uh, in in working at such different land scales, we have a lot of uh, people in the audience who are either young scientists or people who look at your talk and say, "Oh wow, I I really hope that um, one day I can have a, a, a presentation like that." where you're taking something from gene level all the way to uh, phenotyping, to uh, uh, being applied to translation, right? So my question to you is, what do you tell that person who is trying to bring their career up, who's trying to think and plan about which path they take? And what have you done in your, what have you seen in your career that has set the stage for you to be as successful as you are? and to think as broadly as you have done. Thank you so very much, uh, so very much, uh, Martin. Uh, yep. You know, of course I consider, you know, I'm just, you know, one of the many, right? Uh, just chasing my own passion. Uh, there are so many, you know, great and successful scientists in the field, no question about it. Uh, but I think in terms of the experience or something I can share, I would feel really the passion is, you know, what I feel making us happy and doing all the work we are doing. So I can probably share some of the experience I had or thought process I had earlier. Uh, I learned those molecular, you know, bio sensor, you know, to the really, you know, molecular level uh, from uh, Professor Xu Chen and Roger Chen. And we do a lot of work to visualize and understand how the cell think at the molecular level. And, uh, you know, I had a, like a career, like a transition from uh, Illinois back to San Diego. At that time I was thinking, oh, we want to do something laterally or maybe completely different, right? Uh, and we know in academia, you probably really cannot do something completely different. Probably something still connected, but maybe drastically different. So yep. in that sense, we were thinking, okay, we have done a lot of this, you know, visualization, understanding of the nature. And uh, if it's, you know, drastically different, it, it's gotta be, how do we change the nature, right? At the time, we you know, we did not have experience changing the nature. That's how it triggered me to think about how we can, you know, utilizing or, you know, build up expertise to do something, you know, change the nature. And uh, basically cell therapy is the wall mainly because if you want to change the nature, there are two things or two main directions you can choose. One, you can build a house, build a building, right? Building, essentially. Mm-hmm. Or you can, you know, basically take it apart or destroy. So you only have two choices, build or destroy, right? And uh, as a beginner, uh, we think, okay, destroy, of course, will be much simpler in terms of the, you know, the technical, you know, difficulties. And uh, that's how we choose destroy. And to destroy, of course, you don't want to destroy good things, right? You obviously, yeah. you know, want to preserve them and maintain them. But yeah. 
destroy enemies is not a problem, right? <laughs> so who is the enemy? It's a cancer, essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. So we start to think, oh, how can we use these tools to, you know, destroy cancer and control, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the can cancer. And uh, based on our own experience, we are, you know, like to familiar with molecules and cells, and then choices are quite limited. Cell-based therapy. Yeah using immune cells to control tumor. And that's how we get to today, you know, basically moving further and further because not only you want to establish the mechanism, you also want to demonstrate, particularly for therapeutics, how it works, you know, at the end, right? Which is animals to the larger scale. So that's why we gradually move from molecules eventually, you know, to the, the real applications in animals. So I think, okay. Yeah, there are probably many factors along the way, but one major factor is really the passion. Uh, that's also the part which I like academia, you know. That's why I also encourage a lot of maybe students here, you know, to take the lot in academia. I myself enjoy enormously, you know, academia field. You have complete freedom, whichever you like, as long as you have a passion and the persistence, you will just keep going. And, uh, you know, it's also one example of me that I had my degree in mechanical engineering from Peking University, uh, but now I can do whatever I want. <laughs> There's no boundary. So that's the beauty yeah. of academia. And the patching is really the garden for me. Martin, maybe I can add uh, one more question here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, uh, following these questions, Peter really done a lot, right? Yeah, especially Peter was changing his field from uh, his end and master degree, right? His yep. end and master right. degree. Yeah. But also, you enter two big names, right? You got your PhD from two big names, Professor Tian, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, Professor yes. Chen Xi and Professor Roger Chen. So they right. are so famous. Yeah, you also are genius. So how do you work <laughs> together with all this? Did you feel a big pressure and how you figure out, you know, I, I'm serious on this. Yeah, many students, they got to the, you know, big names as a supervisor, as it give some troubles, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's also a great question. Uh, again, I have to say I'm extremely, you know, fortunate, you know, Professor Xu Chen, Roger Chen, you know, uh, and they are just wonderful mentors, like Professor Xu Chen, you know, along the way, you know, give me all the support and help in every single step of my career. And uh, he, you know, although like uh, so well established and uh, famous, as you mentioned, uh, you never feel the pressure. You know, when you engage with him, talking to him, he always treats everybody as a friend, uh, you know, whether it's a student, or his peers, or a dean, or you know, uh, principals, or, or chancellors, whoever you are, he treats you, mm -hmm. you know, exactly the same, and uh, you don't really have much pressure. Uh, so I'm really lucky, you know, in that sense, you know, I have to be, you know, uh, like a frank. Right? I'm blessed. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but these mentors really, you know, I cannot say, you know, much more than, you know, enough actually. Yeah. But, but actually, uh, I think Roger worked with uh, George Whiteside at some point, right? Roger Sien? Uh, yeah, I don't think they are, I, you know, too close. They're not connected. Uh, I, I, might, I might have mistaken it, but I, I thought he was in George's group for some time. But anyway, um, because he, the, 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 what you're describing is sounding more like being in a Bob Langer's group or George Weiss's group. It's, it's very, very similar. Uh, but, but then, you, you know, the, just to follow up on the two questions that uh, we've, uh, we've asked you about this whole area, you present the good results. But what I could not stop seeing and asking myself is how many failures have you had in pursuit of all these? And a lot of students, especially when they are early, they see a paper you published, they see all these beautiful results, and some of them think, oh my goodness, they just did 20 experiments and they got the data. The unfortunate thing is that we didn't have a session where you can tell us about, oh, when we were doing this, this is the many experiments that failed. Uh, how, do you, um, how do you handle 
the disappointment of having a very wonderful hypothesis where you go to the lab and the lab surprises you and tells you you're thinking the wrong way. This is the way it should go. And how do you encourage somebody who's adding their career, uh, being a PhD student, a postdoc, or uh, an assistant professor somewhere to deal with failure? Because we, we, we publish only like a, a, a small percentage of what we do because our hypotheses are annihilated every time we go to the lab. So how, how do you uh, advise somebody to deal with failure? And that's gonna be my last question. Thank you. Yeah, that's an outstanding question. You know, uh, we always encounter those kind of scenario and the situation, right? Uh, so that's my personal opinion, of course, uh, I, I can share. My feeling would be, there are three things I could emphasize. One, of course, the passion, right? Always, you know, you have a dream, you know, this will basically lift you up whenever there's difficulty, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, you really want to chase this dream as long as you have, you know, a dream, you keep going, whatever, uh, no matter what. So that's yeah. the first thing. The second thing I would think, you know, a really, you know, healthy, energetic body, actually. So I also always, you know, tell our students and the lab members, no matter how important or how many you know projects you have, the first priority is always exercising. You know, maintain a very good you know like style, right? No matter how busy you are, always reserve time, some time, to you know go gym. You know, keep yourself healthy and energetic. Mm, that's mm -hmm. the second one, and third one I thought would be uh, really teamwork. You want to develop comradeship and yeah. uh, you know formulate teams with your colleagues friends you know because everybody will encounter difficulty and sometimes difficulty will be quite you know like enormous so if you have friendship and teamwork you know just some other people talking together you know sometimes they provide you know ideas and suggestions sometimes even just provide the moral support you know go mm -hmm. out have a lunch or dinner together those also will be tremendously helpful because, you know, difficulty, they were always coming up, right? That cannot be avoided. No question mm -hmm. about it. But those, you know, like the three things together, hopefully will help you to go or persist longer. And uh, yeah. in all experience, if you are really persistent and enthusiastic, you know, in general, you can always achieve the goal. I can mm -hmm. actually use uh, maybe one example, you know, uh, uh, local specific imaging part, it was tremendously difficult. We did not really expect at all in the beginning because we have, you know, using this bar sensor to visualize, you know, molecular events have done that for like more than 10 years. We thought, oh, we have a lot of experience, right? And uh, visualizing the genome locus probably wouldn't be too difficult, but turns out extremely difficult, mainly because mm -hmm. all these proteins, RNAs, you have like, tens of thousands or even more copies, right? Easy mm -hmm. to detect, even at the single cell level. But if you only have one copy of the DNA in the ocean or this noise, tremendous <laughs> amount of difficulty. And, yep. uh, you know, just like you go to downtown, try to see the sky and the stars, uh, there's no way. And, yep. uh, you know, Dr. Qingpeng really gone through so many different ways try to see them, you know, always fail, you know, like just nothing, all very noisy background. And, yeah. you know, she tried all this difficulty and, uh, you know, eventually found out this solution, right? But after so many rounds of difficulty, I think the really the thing helped her to go through all this difficulty is these three things in my opinion. You know, while she's always persistent and uh, enthusiastic, you know, even sometimes, you know, it's a failed result experiment, she still can, you know, regain the energy quickly, second day, for example. And, yep. uh, you know, she also, you know, have a very good habit of life, you know, keep, you know, very good style and exercise a lot. And uh, mm -hmm. she's very good in person, uh, you know, people skill. And she mm -hmm. a lot of friends in the lab. That also helped her to, you know, keep moving in long, you know, distance, in my opinion. Eventually excelled. Uh, we were very at good. one point try to drop this project. But, you know, we, we are lucky at the same time. Yeah. Yep. V very good. Very, very encouraging. Uh, very, very inspiring. I think uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to choose to move to the next. So, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, if this was in person, 
I believe Alice and I would walk on the across the floor and hand you a certificate uh, uh, for being our host in the 109th volume. But now please accept this uh, virtual certificate, which we'll be emailing to you after this. Also, I would like to invite everyone to come and join us now next week, where I'll also be uh, hosting Professor Johan Foster, uh, who will be talking to us about uh, Lordship Firas and uh, basically more about biomaterial, uh, use of biomaterials in, uh, in uh, making uh, uh, composites. So please join us next week. And with that, I want to say thank everyone. A fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Great. so much.不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界为我鼓掌。不必太在意身旁近期的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗。I can, I can。